Oh, God, it smells like something died in here. Uh, anyway, uh, what's going on? Welcome to another episode of Crime Face with Bonnie Dustin. Today, we're back in an aeroid greenhouse at uh, Mobot at Missouri Botanical Garden in wonderful St. Louis. Doesn't everybody love St. Louis? I don't know if that's true. I don't think everybody loves St. Louis, but I, I like St. Louis. Anyway, uh, this is part two of a uh, two-part episode. Uh, well, that's two different episodes, you know what I mean. Uh, they're both long as hell, and they're both only about the aeroid family Araceae. Evolution, pollination, biology, distribution, uh, why there's such high rates of microendemism. That means, you know, uh, lots of different species. Uh, you know, most of them restricted to a, a very narrow area, a narrow region, you know, a narrow distribution pattern. Um, and uh, why the genus Anthurium has so many goddamn species in it. So we talk about all this stuff. I mostly let Tom Crow do the, do the talking. He's the Aeroid Wizard here in the Aeroid Dungeon. But either way, I hope you, uh, I hope you enjoy this. If you're not uh, familiar with Aeroids already, uh, you will be or you'll just be uh, bored. So uh, either way, I hope you enjoy this. Uh, that's all I got to put on. A terrible smell is probably coming from uh, one of these bastards over here. You know, they, they tend to mimic the smell of rotting flesh uh, to uh, entice uh, beetles that normally eat rotting flesh. Uh, to come pollinate them. But anyway, we're just going to launch right into it and uh, let's go find Tom Crow. Here we go. Okay, so Tom, tell us about what we're looking at here. It's a species of philodendron, right? Well, we don't know what it is. It's, it's possibly a new species. Largely, if you can't figure out what they are, if you can't name them, they're new. But uh, I was I was wanting to point out something about the pollination system of these species with unisexual flowers. Philodendron, Caladium, Xanthosoma, Diefenbachia, that group. So you can see that the, the spathe is right now is open and it's ready to accept the beetles that would come and pollinate it. And I'm gonna pull this out of here. It's just one of several inflorescences that are in this cluster of inflorescences for that species. And as you can see, it's got a long peduncle. This is called a profile. It's, a, it's the structure that protects this when it's young. So it has a long peduncle, uh, rough, roughly as long as the spathe. And then when you open the spathe, you'll see that the flowers are divided into two parts. So well, you got the male up top and a female yeah. down below. And furthermore, if you'll notice carefully, you see this little ring of flowers that are kind of a different shape and a different color. You can scarcely see them under this light, but there's a there's a quarter inch wide ring of flowers here. Right. They, those are sterile male flowers, and they contain no pollen at all. They have only uh, lipids in these flowers. The lipids are a type of oil that's nutritious. It'd be like sucking on a butter or some butter, stick of butter or something. But this, this, uh, uh, when the beetles come in here to have sex, which is the whole purpose of aggregating in these places, is to is to breed. They'll come in in, in, in some considerable numbers, and they will have sex. Uh, and while they're there for 24 hours, they're going to be eating this these lipids. Oh, so it's like a post-coital meal. So it, they go in there and they bang and then orgy. they eat. It's orgy. There's one orgy right, after it's another. It's like a big yeah. filthy orgy and then they eat afterwards it, and, then, and then they hang out for a while. Well, they probably they eat the whole time, yeah. They might be munching and screwing that at the same time. That doesn't sound like a bad life. Anyway, and then they just, the next night they go off to another flower. So they just do the same over. Of course, it would be different beetles in, in, in many right, cases. So right, it wouldn't right. be the same ones necessarily. I had no idea beetles were so, so raunchy. So then, then you have, these are the female flowers. When they arrive, they're covered with pollen, and they get down in here, and, and they screw around. And they also end up smearing pollen all over this part of the spadix, the female part. So they do it all this time. So are the, the female and male flowers are open at the same time, or they're female No, no, first, no, right? no. This one has, these female flowers, these male flowers will not be operational. Right. So like all aeroids, except for erysema, they're, uh, they're female first, they're, they're protog protogenous. Okay, so what's going to happen is, as the beetles come in with the pollen, they're going to get the pollen on this part of the spadix. It's going to be well pollinated because they're going to be crawling around in here, covering this thing with me. Now, after about 12 hours, this thing will have closed, and the beetles are inside. It doesn't close completely. They're still in there. They, they, they will survive the next whole day inside the, inside the spadix with it slightly, slightly open. Then the following night, what happens is that this thing begins to open up again. And at that time, they have a second wave of heat from this, the oxidation of uh, salicylic acid, the oxidation of the starch. And this creates heat, which generates more of these pheromones again. The pheromone 
attracts the beetles uh, uh, to the flower in the first place. But as they leave, they're carrying with it the pollen that's by that time coming out like toothpaste out of a out of a stepped-on toothpaste dispenser, uh -huh. and it's squirting pollen all over them. Jesus! So they're carrying it off with their sticky outer surfaces because they've been covered with a resin. If you look carefully, now it's a bit too early to see, but later on there will be little little rows of resin that are that that are appearing in this spathe. That will get all over the outside of the beetle because the beetle is very, very slick. It's like a like a acrylic paint. It, They're glossy. It will not. Uh, it, it's uh, you know itself by itself is not sticky. Right. So they have glossy to put, finish. They have to put the tar on their bodies, and then that that allows them to cr collect the pollen. And then the pollen is stuck to the beetles. And at that point, it's about six, seven o'clock at night. They are flying off to find another flower. And of course, a few few yards away, there'll be another flower that's open on another plant, and they will be visiting that flower, doing the same thing all over again. They're carrying the pollen in and carrying pollen out. So tonight is just a buzz with beetles and then the scent of these these flowers. So what? Describe the habitat for us. What's the habitat going to look like where these are? Well, this is going on. Well, uh, I mean, there'll be there'll be plants everywhere. This will not be an easy path for the beetle to get from one plant to the next because you know this one might be interrupted by three trees and and, and uh, the beetle the beetle will be flying by sonar basically he's 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 smelling the scent as he goes along this scent path and he's wiggling back and forth because the scent is kind of like radar it gets stronger the beam is stronger in the middle the scent is stronger so he he stays on this path and follows it to its course. When the beetle gets really close to the flower, uh, he will probably see the flower because the, the flower is colorful on the inside or at least it's it'll stand out in the night. Mm -hmm. So the beetle simply comes in and probably misses this but crashes, crash lands into the back of the spathe. They do not land like a helicopter. Oh, so that's kind of the adaptive benefit of the spathe, too, is it helps like a funnel, like it, collect these it, these pollen, these beetle pollinators. It not only directs the wafting pheromone out, like a, like a radar would, but it also allows the beetle to find and fall it collects, into the spathe. It collects these sex-hungry, you know, yeah. uh, uh, food-hungry beetles yeah. and just dumps them into the base of that. Sending and, out, uh, out of scent to attract them, and then when they come back, they go thud, 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 you know, they fall right, in Right, so here. this is a hot, humid, dark understory of a tropical yeah. forest where all this is going on. And uh, and and the beetles uh, do not just restrict themselves to one species. For example, some of these beetles may pollinate uh, Philodendron grandifolia for a while. Then they may switch to a Xanthosoma... Mexicanum, then they may switch to a palm. How long uh, these beetles live for generally? I do not know, but they're relatively long life. I mean, you know, they must live several years. Jesus, really? No, I, I had no idea that long. They, they overwinter in the, in the soil, I and mean, there's nothing to kill them because, uh. you know, they're big structures, so I have no idea what the length of the life cycle is. So that's them. what they do. They just, every, you know, they just well, fly. It's not like a fly. They don't, you know, they, right. don't, they don't just come and go in a fortnight so right right so beetles they're long lived that's pretty are, cool you know, but how, and how many how many of the aeroids would you say are pollinated by beetles what percentage rough estimate oh probably nearly every one of them that has uh unisexual flowers because we don't know of any other thing that could pollinate them they're all developed for beetles you know they have the same syndrome they they have they have a scent that goes out they have a place for the beetles to meet to aggregate uh, you know, the whole system is set up for beetle pollination. Now, other things like Anthurium or Spathophyllum, they're pollinated by bees. We know this because we've seen a lot, have made a lot of observations on them. They have uh, they have strong, unique odors. The the unique odor is presented at a specific specific time and and place. And the bee the bees uh, are often trap lining bees. They will they will fly around the forest. They're not necessarily pollinating one thing, but usually the ones that are pollinating anthuriums, they will pollinate that, that thing pretty exclusively for a while. And then probably they switch to another similar scent when that anthurium uh, species no longer has any scent being produced. Then the bee, of course, is looking for food. 
and it's looking for to collect these uh, these uh, uh, pheromones that it, it it attracts the female with. So it's 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 going to patch off onto another thing that is very similar, and then it might it might develop a, a pollination. Uh, system with with that species and anthurium of course bisexual flowers but uh, uh, you know which is unlike philodendron but they're still protogenous they're still female first. yes they're protogenous so the so the insect would come when the droplets were present on the stigmas of the of the anthurium flower and then they would leave before the stamens were on but it, it's they're also visiting the same plant later with which has stamens because the plant produces the pheromone which attracts them so at some point it's, it's visiting the female portion, uh, female flowers, and at a later time it might be visiting the ant, uh, collecting pollen, because otherwise it would be a useless system. It wouldn't work if if you didn't have both pollen and and pistils at the same time. They're also being attracted to the to the plant because of its scent, and many of these species, like the euglossine bees, they are specifically collecting that scent. Right. The, the, the scent is created by the flower, and uh, and it's I think it's just a little waxy surface on the flower. They scrape this off, they carry it away in their scrubiculae, and therefore they are smelling like that flower. Right, and the, you you glossy and, and bees of course pollinate a lot of orchids yeah, as well. And so they're so they're they're smelling, they're 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 carrying the pollen the scent from that in, from that anthurium. They're they're flying around aggregating to try to attract female bees for breeding purposes. So the whole purpose there is quite deceitful. They're not really after pollination, of course. They're after the scent. Right. And the scent is attracting the females so that they can breed. They're just trying because to get again, pampered it's, with it's cologne. Again, it's with sex, you see, because the the, bee, the bees are looking for a female, and they're using the plant as an intermediate. And the, and the plant is the plant is benefiting because they're getting pollinated by, by and, these. And the scent actually helps these male bees get laid, like it actually works. It's it's what attracts the, the female, yeah. Oh, now why I don't know. I mean the females. Wow. Why don't the females go to the flower? Perhaps they do, but it seems to be the males who are collecting the scent, flying around and and trying to attract the females. And they're collecting that scent for sexy time. And the same thing happens with spathiphyllum. Spathiphyllum has a very similar syndrome. It's completely unrelated, but it has hermaphroditic flowers also. Uh, Anthurium has bisexual or hermaphroditic flowers. And so does Pathophyllum. And both genera have bee pollinated uh, pollination systems. And where's Pathophyllum dis dis distributed? Where's the distribution well, it's, in it? It's, uh, it's, it's almost exclusively neotropical, but there are three species in Asia. Okay. And uh, we thought they probably were, you know, uh, distantly related, but in fact, the molecules seem to show that they're. They really are uh, the same genus. Uh. Many of the older, old world genera that were at one point uh, distributed to the new world have turned out to be just segregate genera. So let's talk about this. This, this is Ancomanes, which is primarily African, and it just, I mean, it essentially looks like a big spiny amorphophallus, but it's got these huge uh, codices. Massive tumor, yeah. yeah. Now in the wild, these things would not be sticking up out of the ground like this. They're only doing that because we got them in a pot and they have no place to grow, so they're just forcing themselves up out of the ground. So these would be buried in otherwise. The, in, the, in the African jungle, these things would just be a little bit below the level surface of the ground. And then they would be pushing up these leaves from the, from the tubers, from the stems, the rhizomes. But because it's in a pot and they have no place to go, they're just being shoved up out of the pot. And it's got this because there's a there's a dry season basically. There's a, a they experience oh, seasonal yeah. dryness. It's, nearly all of Africa does have periods of drought, and and uh, like many of the genera that we have, they are uh, seasonal. They they go dormant during a period of, for, during a time of the year. Now this has this has bisexual inflorescence, unisexual flowers. I'm going to take this off, or at least take it apart here. You can see now that the bottom of the oh, spadix, that's beautiful. Look the at bottom that. of the spathe has the female flowers on it. And then there again, see this little hump here, mm -hmm. a little bit more yellow. Those are sterile male flowers, and then the rest of the flowers are all male. And they so produce pollen. Those sterile male flowers. What are they doing? They're providing some sort of it's reward. It's the same thing that does with philodendron. They eat it. So when they come here to, to pollinate this, and I don't know how they're pollinated, but I assume it's pollinated by some beetle, almost certain. 
it wouldn't be a bee. So the beetles probably, they probably aggregate in here. This thing does not reclose like philodendron does. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really trap them in there. But nevertheless, they're probably smaller beetles and they probably just aggregate in here safe from being picked off by birds. So we got female flowers down below and then these kind of, not staminodes because it's an entire this, flower this is, that's yeah, sterile. This is, this is actually, these mm. little flowers, you can see they're kind of cream colored. It's an entire flower just, just that's two sterile. Or three, just two or three rows of flowers. Right, so sterile male flowers and then the, the fertile male flowers are the top it's of the It's kind of hard to see the flowers on this. They're so small. Right. But they're, and they're all mushed together right now because it just opened up. But, I mean, there's thousands of flowers on this mm. inflorescence. So every every couple of millimeters, you'd have a different flower. So the females, of course, are ready right now. They're mature, and then these will mature later, the, the white male flowers. Yeah, yeah. The, there's no pollen coming off of here yet. Right. But it's probably exactly the same way. Probably tomorrow, it would have had pollen on it. God, that color is incredible on those flowers. It's so it's such a rich, like, it's, burgundy. And that that is a very common color for uh, aeroids. I mean, that violet purple, which is what I call it. It's, it's not really, it's not purple, it's not blue, it's not red. We call that violet purple. And that is a very common color theme throughout for berries and for flowers as well. So, and this this is a bit more purplish here. It's just green, heavily tinged with purple. That speed, when it first comes out, it's probably just green. So let's, it, let's talk about this mottling you see on the stem. Because we had, we had briefly touched on that uh, earlier. So that modeling, what do you think is the adaptive benefit well, of that? Or uh, what could be the adaptive benefit of that? I, I think it's almost certainly the result of protection. These things, of course, have these spines, too. So they have a little bit more protection than Amorphophallus or Dracontium. But all of these things that produce one leaf, one leaf, they have spotted petals. And, and we think that perhaps the reason is when, when an herbivorous animal sees these pedicles and petioles they look like snakes I mean it looks like a it looks like the pattern of a snake some of them look very much like a snake so they're probably saying ah stay away from that snake and avoid eating it mm. so by by and because it's it's so such a serious matter if you take one of these plants like this one it produces one leaf one petiole Okay, many many of the big things. They'll right. have this is one. all one leaf, right? It's one leaf, and so if that if that was the only leaf on the plant, which it often is, and you cut <coughs> it off just after it come out of the tuber, that's it. The tuber takes the tuber has stored energy, and when you produces the leaf, that tuber becomes like a walnut. It's, mm -hmm. it's very small, and then after it grows a while for a few months, then the tuber gets pumped back up again full starch and it's capable of, uh, of building another leaf again. So it's the pumping action of taking it out and putting it back in. If you cut the leaf off at the wrong time, you could actually kill the plant. It's a big loss. Set it Huge way back. loss. How does, how does so it that's why the, that's why the plant has a lot of investment mm -hmm. in that one leaf. And perhaps for that reason, the mottling, the snake-like mottling would be a, an appropriate adaptation to a pr uh, Herbivory. Right, defensive to defensive strategy, basically. To, pre prevent, to prevent the plant from being eaten. Back, back to the flower really quick. How does this smell? Does it smell feeded? I mean, does no, it No, no, this one, this one. Does this ever smell? Because some of these things stink, right? Because it could be that it, it does it at night and we never would know. Yeah, I haven't No, I, I, neither have I. But my guess is that probably... Since it's unlikely be, likely to be beetle pollinated, it probably flowers. All, I mean, it probably has a scent only at night, and it may be very late at night, so that we may never have ever detected the scent. Now, what are these? What do these fruits mature into? You know, at, when they're done. I mean, what well, are they? Uh, what the spurs? Have we are? ever had berries developing on ancomanes? Are they red? They must just be little droops, like, like every other that, anthurium. That root. And there is where I see. But they probably wouldn't have gotten pollinated anyway, so chances are they're not going to have. I have, I have grown some from berries. See, this one has a completely different space on it. I'm taken with these. There really are like not, these. there are not very many Ancomani species total. Probably fewer than, fewer than six, I would say. Oh, only in six all. species. This well, genus. they come from Africa, and Africa is not a diverse area in almost anything except, you know, big mammals. Mm. Uh, 
the plants of Africa are substantially fewer in number than those in the Asian tropics or in the American tropics. And it's probably because Africa has dried up to, to a great extent. You know, the Sahara was once a jungle, and now it's, uh, now it's you know, nothing but sand dunes. Speeding is completely uh, uh, simple. And it's, as you see, all these things we've looked at so far, the spadix is just a cylindrical structure. So what, so what is this right here? Well, in this case, these little things here are the staminodia. I mean, that, that's, those are, that's where the pollen is. So all up and down here, they got these stalked male flowers. The, mostly, generally, the, the male flowers are just inconsequential little things. You don't even see them. They're inside. Right. They push the pollen out. It's a very in bizarre case, structure pollen, for an aeroid. The pollen is out here on the end of a long stalk. God knows what pollinates. It's, it's so very, who, who are we looking at here? What species? Synandrospedix vermitoxicum. And where's this from? It's from Bolivia and Peru. It's again a you know a, a plant occurring in some semi-dry habitats. Most of the most of the vegetation from that part of the tropics in the Andes are relatively it's relatively dry for us. But uh, I've not seen these. Uh, I've only seen it once in the wild, and it was just growing along the road. So I, I'm really not sure what its actual habitat is. Oh, there's there's one that's just coming into flower. So what are these ovaries? What, what do they mature into? What is that fruit? Well, there'll be berry there'll right? be berries on there. Yes, yes. So these are the pistillate flowers, obviously, and they're stocked as well. So the so the berries are obviously going to be sticking out. Christ, that's weird to Here, see an arrow. Here's like that. here's one that. Oh yeah, there it you was, go. This is how it was a little bit a little bit later than you were you saw it last time when it was it was turned down in here. So now rats. you now you can see that it's Rad. it's beginning to come out of the space. And these spaces are very convoluted at the base, so that they they, God, they it's such a weird they don't open structure completely. Too, and it's kind of beautiful. <laughs> and you can see you can see the 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 female flowers all look like that. They they're now here's here's another thing. Oh yeah, there you go. Down below, you, there are some. Look at your fingers just see, see how the pollen. female. Look at that. See how the female. This is the real female female flowers. These are all staminate flowers. Uh -huh. And then there's staminodia. These little white things. Are in between the, the pistils, those are staminodes. And you staminodes. can even they're you can sterile. even see that they're they're initially it was a bisexual inflorescence, which which became a unisexual inflorescence, because they're the signs of the old stamens. Mm -hmm. They're they're non-functional, mm -hmm. but you can see how these are these are male down here. They're female, but then they got these little structures scattered in between them that are really uh, evolutionarily they're male. So those staminodes, what are they? They're providing like a lipid molecule that. that I don't know whether I don't know whether the pollination system on this system eats anything, but I assume it. I assume there are rewards of some sort. Right, because why would you shelve your, your pollen producing But alternatively, structures some of these things are completely uh, non-functional, like the appendix. It was it there you go. At one half time had a function. Right. So they haven't really gotten rid of it, but they don't really need it. So they might just be vestigial. They may be vestigial organisms that uh, organs from from a from a formerly bise bisexual inflorescence. So are those female flowers still receptive, or are they? Dumb? Yeah. Well, no, no. I'm sure they. I'm sure they are receptive. No. All it's hard to say. This, this pollen is is very actively coming off. So perhaps uh -huh. those are already defunct. Uh -huh. Generally speaking, if you got a lot of pollen, you're not going to have stigmatic activity. How so often do you get pollination actually occur? Like I say, an insect gets in here or some kind of beetle, and you end up getting. Well, good we get fruit. very few insects in here because they deliberately try to keep them out. You know, they have this. They have right. The thing is screened. So, because if we did have a lot of insects, we we could have some interesting pollination going on. But mm -hmm. we know that they're not pollinated, getting pollinated here because we have plants that have been here for years and years and years and they never produce any berries. Do you guys ever cross pollinate and the yourself? Only, the only way they'll get berries is if we do it ourselves. You do that so, sometimes? or Yes, yes. Uh, it's relatively easy to cross things within sections. If you have, if you if you stay within the section, if you try to cross between one section and another, then it's more difficult. And explain to everybody what a section is. It's a taxonomic clade in a, in a genus. Well, it's a, a section is a portion of a genus. So not all the species in a genus are identical. Uh, they, they drop, they fall into groups. And in the case of philodendron and in the case of anthurium, there are lots of groups. Anthurium has, uh, we have 20 recognized sections now, and probably there'll end up being like 30 in all. How many species total in the genus anthurium? A few thousand? 
I think it's the largest genus in the world, and I think it, I think it easily has three thousand species, oh. uh, which would, which would give it, uh, uh, which would make it competitive as being the largest genus, mm. because I think the largest genus known is Astragalus. Astragalus, I was going to say. And I believe yeah. it has a little over three thousand species, and there are some other close competitors. Uh, I, I'm not sure what, about Pleurothallus. It's an orchid that, that have many, many species described. I think if any genus competed with Anthurium, it might be Pleurothallus. But the reason why I'm the reason why I'm counting on Anthurium being the largest is that it's by far more poorly known than any orchid group. Uh, there are there are 25 or 30 air, uh, orchid orchidologists for every air writer. There's just many, many more people working on orchids. And why do you think anthurium is so species rich? What do you think leads to that? Just lots of endemism I, or seed dispersal? I, well, clearly, clearly, the endemism is one of the driving factors. But then, what causes endemism? Uh, endemism is caused when a plant cannot get pollinated on a wide basis. That is to say, if the if it's not scattering its pollen a long way, or it's not scattering its seeds a long way, it's going to remain very localized. So Anthurium has two things going for it. Number one, they're pollinated by an equally species group of bees. Uh, of course, Euglossian bees are no, by no means as large as Anthurium, but there are other organisms undoubtedly uh, pollinating Anthurium, other bees, and perhaps even in insects we don't even know about, because only a tiny fraction of Anthuriums are actually known to have real pollinators. Mm. The majority of the species, we have no idea what pollinates them. So pollinator specificity leads, can lead to reproductive uh, and, isolation? And the other thing that's very important for Anthurium is that it, it, it is almost exclusively bird dispersed. Now these aren't robins or crows or magpies that are, that are territorial, I mean they're flying in and out. They're not migratory birds, they're, they're territorial birds. Some of these birds don't move during their entire lifetime. They're they jungle birds. They breed not, in one right. place. They stay there their entire lives. They defend their area. They just simply don't get out. Area size of this greenhouse would be large for some of these so birds. So homebodies. They're like jungle birds tend to be homebodies. And they since don't they to stay in their same forest all the time, and they are probably the dispersers of the plant, the species do not, does not send its seeds very far. I mean, many birds will not cross over a, a narrow river. They just won't go to the other side. So you can imagine the birds are speciating as well, because they're 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 trapped in one little place, and over time, some genetic changes in the bird creates another species of bird, and the isolation is the same pattern. They, they, they remain isolated, and because because of the territoriality, uh, the, the small range of diversity that they have, they're not spreading the seeds of anthuriums, which might evolve in C2. From uh, either a mutatic a mut 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 a mutant uh, strain or from hybridization, and then you have another species that remains there uh, indefinitely. For so most of most years. of these seeds don't get very far in Anthurium. Basically, no, they stay no. pretty. I mean, we know that because they're not widely they're, they're not widely uh, separated mm. in in, uh, in geographic terms, mm. and in fact, they're not widely separated in elevational terms. Most species of Anthurium, if you go up the side of a mountain. You will find, you know, after a few kilometers uh, and, and a few more meters of elevation, you'll, you'll start finding other species. Some species will drop out, others will come in, and then that keeps on going. So that any particular species is often not very widely spread, separated. In fact, even in the lowlands where there are no barriers, physically no, no physical barriers, uh, you can drive down the road from one ditch to the next, you know, one riverbank or one stream to the next, and what you found at the one river, you won't find at the next river. And it might only be one kilometer away. Uh, so there, there's, there's, uh, there's, there, there is a distribution pattern among these aeroids that is just phenomenal. Como se dice microendemics, right? A lot of yeah, microendemics. Yeah. Right. I remember when I went to La Planada, which is in the uh, Nariño Department of Colombia, I spent uh, a couple of weeks there because I was in, interested in riding a flora of the area. And I, I found maybe 53 species, which is very low for for an aeroid area. But it's it's high. It's 1,900 meters to 2,500 meters. That's pretty high for aeroids. I 
I, I kind of got bored with that place. And so one day I had an opportunity to go to a little river nearby. It was basically <laughs> something you could see from, from Lump Lanon. You could see down to this river. And not a single species at that river was growing at La Planada. That sounds overwhelming. It sounds like wonderfully overwhelming. Like, do you get overwhelmed when you're out on, oh, on these field course, excursions course. or what? I, I mean, mean there's could, just so much work to do, collecting you can and, go, and you logging can, everything. And I once collected in a little place uh, a, a new road that was going from the from the Rio Atrato to a little town called Iro. And I was in maybe one kilometer in on this road. And I began collecting one day. Then I came back the next day because I knew that I wasn't done. I came back a third day, and I continued the whole time to find more and more and more <laughs> species. I finally, after three days, I thought, I really just should go on someplace else because surely there's another place just like this, equally rich. So I, I kind of wish I had stayed there for a week so that I could have assured myself that in that spot, there were X number of species. Make sure you get everything. Right. So one, when of the, one of the things that I have actually published on is uh, how you can do surveys by simply going to a place collecting everything you see and just counting them up and then go to another place and do the same thing collect everything you see say in one day uh, and then just count up to how many species you have in one place and how many species you, you have in the other place and probably with this alone plus looking at the live zone map you could have a good judge of species diversity by habitat by live zone and of course the live zone is going to be uh, greatly affect what you find because in certain live zones you have a lot of species and others you have a lot, lot fewer. For example, if you look at pre-montane moist forest or pre-montane dry forest or, or a tropical pre-montane montane forest, all of these things, zones are relatively near one another but they have no, not very many features in common. Because in one place it might be cold and dry, in another place it might be cold and wet, in another place it might be hot and wet, or hot and dry. And every one of those features is going to affect the number of species that occur there. Not only the number, but which species occur there. So what do you do when you collect? Tell us what you do. You get herbarium collections, you keep a journal, you describe, you, you log it with a number, you describe the habitat. What exactly do you do? Well, I usually pick a, a place to go based on the history of somebody else having been there because obviously if you've never been there you don't know the place if it exists so somebody has to have stumbled onto the place at least once for you to know that there's a road there that there's actually a place to go to furthermore just because there's a place doesn't necessarily mean it's good but if somebody comes back from a place and they, they went to a certain spot just by chance they they drove there to see some friend then they found that they had a few species that they brought them back and I say these are all new. Where'd you find these? They'll say, well, it's down this road, you know, such and such. And then I would put that in my in my mind, you know, I'm gonna try to see that place. And oftentimes I'm just going to a place because somebody collected something interesting. They're one plant and it's something that I wanna see. So I'll go back to this place. Sometimes I'm sometimes I'm really disappointed. You will just collected an anthurium in a in a place north of the Bahia de Caracas which is actually in Venezuela, in, in Ecuador, not not to, not Venezuela. And I thought, my gosh, when I got there, it, it was it looked like a desert. I mean, it was a terrible place. But I kept on driving until I got to the place where he claimed he collected. And sure enough, there was this plant. It was growing there. It was a new species. And then I found several more species in the same little dry quebrada. So I would never have found those had I not, had somebody not brought back a specimen. I would never have gone to that area because it's, it would not be a it would not be a profitable looking place to go. Mm. You generally and it, another thing I do of course is look at the map and find out where there are roads going into new roads going into places that have wet forest. So the wetter the forest and the more unique the forest is, the more likely I am to want to go there. And if you look at a whole these live zone map of, of of some of these countries, you'll find it to be very varied in terms of color they, they use color different color codes for each each live zone and you try to find these unusual live zones because you can be assured that when you find this live zone if there is forest then you you'll find something interesting and new and of course i use google earth 
because just because the map indicates that it's tropical wet forest or pre-montane rainforest or something doesn't necessarily mean there's any forest there. That only is the potential for forest. That's what it would be if there was forest. So I go on Google Earth and I look at the look at the actual map and you can actually see the forest. You can see that it's all green here and it's all dry over here because the, the green would indicate that there's trees there. So it but a combination of using using Google Earth and Holy's Live Zone maps, you could predict where there's gonna be interesting plants. And in the case of Columbia and in the case of Erisi, literally any place you pick on the map, you would find interesting things. Because if there's any forest left, it's going to have new species. So, but that leads us to my next question then is, so you see a lot of, of course, deforestation occurring, namely for agriculture, I suppose. How many, how, what's being lost? And have you been to places that where stuff's already been lost or what? Well, the stuff is being lost, of course, by the minute, and, uh, and a lot of it. Uh, and despite conservation efforts, this is just going to continue to go on. There's, there's no question about it. I mean, the, the population of Colombia is growing, and and, the, and they're going to continue to use the forest until everybody had a job doing something, sitting in the bank. They're going to the people that are people that are farmers or need to need to produce a living by living on the land. They're going to have to have land. So they're going to continue to cut it off, What's and and uh, the the bad part is that it doesn't come back. So once you cut it off, it's gone. You know, as I told you before, the the soil itself is very poor in nutrients. So basically, what's living on that land has evolved there, and it's picked up all the nutrients that existed, and it has them wrapped up in the in the body of the plant life itself, so that. When, once those things have been cut off and burned and, and, and removed by a fire, then there's nothing left in the soil. So that, that mountain of, of reserves of protoplasm doesn't exist anymore. It's in the ocean. So then the only thing that will occur there are ferns, which will grow on nothing, and lichens and fungi, some things that just you know require very few nutrients. They'll survive them, but you couldn't get big trees to grow there again. What's the best hope for conserving these places and, you know, for, for preventing species extinction, in your opinion? Well, I, 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 think, I think it's the economy. I mean, if people, if people have, if people are wealthy, they don't cut down their forest. If, if, the, if a country has good economic uh, potential, it has, uh, there, there are lots of, everybody has a job doing something that's not cutting off forest, then they're going to, their, their land is going to be, I mean, the United States has the United States has more more land, more uh, more more plants today than it did in the 1800s. Because then they cut them all off. They cut Missouri was nearly nearly denuded of trees. Mm -hmm. So a lot of that's come back. So certainly alleviating alleviating poverty is a good way exactly. to, to help conservation I mean, efforts. Uh, for example, Singapore Singapore is an island in near uh, near uh, the Malayan Peninsula, and it, it's one of the most densely populated places on Earth, and yet it's also one of the quietest, cleanest, and most uh, homogeneous. It's very, it's a very wonderful place to, to visit. You don't hear cars. You, you don't have. There's no, there's no pollution. There's the clean air, and and yet it's completely filled with people. And it's simply because they're wealthy. And wealthy people don't like to live in a in, in, a, in a pestle. So they don't they don't allow somebody to honk their horn or or uh, do things that. That happens in most most uh, underdeveloped places. Or poison a river, or yeah. pollute, or anything. Yeah. Okay. yeah. In terms of conservation, it's always better to conserve your land in the state that it is, rather than let it, let it deteriorate. A lot of people want to be able to make use of their land for conservation purposes to attract tourism, or they may just like to have all these native species. Some people are just altruistic. And they purchase this land, they pay the taxes on it, and they they maintain it in forest forever. But of course, that's usually no longer than the person lives, and then their children may have no interest in that land. I mean, I'll give you an example. There was this German couple during the during World War II, when Germany was in bad shape. They immigrated to Colombia, and they walked into this very remote place in a wheeler department. They, they started a farm that was about maybe 
300 hectares. It was a big place. And over the years, you know, he filled some of the trees and he raised cows and he made cheese and he sold butter and cheese and he sold some milk. But that was enough to survive on. Then the rest of the farm, he wanted to leave it in forest because he, he was really at the heart of conservationist. He had come to love this place. And he was the sort of guy who invited botanists. He would write to botanists and say, could you come and, and study my plants? And it's in Colombia or where? Yeah, in Colombia. He was German. He, uh, his name was, uh, I've named the species after him, his wife, and the two of them together. But let me tell you this story. Okay. He gets old and he has to go back to Germany because he has prostate problems or something. And then eventually his wife has to leave and go to Germany. Well, they had a child. They had a, a, a girl. I, I'm not sure any other children, but they have a daughter. The daughter married a Colombian. So she owns the property. What does she do with it? She sells the forest. In fact, the wife was killed because of the forest. The wife was killed by somebody who wanted to cut that forest off. How it happened that she got killed, I don't know, but it involved somebody wanting this land for the forest, for the trees. So the wife was shot. The, the gentleman was back in Germany, and his, water, his daughter eventually sold the land to some developer who, who cut the trees off. So the place was called Finca Marenberg. It was a famous place because many new species were described from this because many botanists had been attracted to go there. It was a remote area and a lot of people went there to see the plants and collect them. Uh, Al Gentry was there, uh, uh, Silverstone, Sopkin, many places were invited there. And it's also true that some of these people that invite botanists in, they want to know what the plants are themselves. I had another friend, he, he was a crazy kind of uh, pioneer guy. He, he would go into, he, he came from uh, New Jersey, I think. And he and his wife went to Columbia, and they also went deeply into the interior, and they had a mule, they carried a little pot belly stove or something, you know, to cook on, and that was it. And they and they set up this little finca. And over the years, uh, he, he cut off some of the forest, and he grew plants, he had some cows, and then he would invite people to come to visit his property, including among them were some botanists from the Universidad Nacional in Bogota. And Enrique Ferrero and four of his students went there. They spent about a week there. And everything that I saw that they collected was new. It was Jesus it was the most Christ. astonishing place. And I wanted to go back there. I mean, I eventually figured out how, how where this place was. But by that time, I was too old to get in there because you had to walk out through three rivers and it takes about a nine hour <laughs> to get in there. So I never made it in there. But I always tried to get other people to go in there and to, to visit this place because I would like to get photographs of all these new species because the, the Colombians did not take any pictures. And I've subsequently described most of these things. Uh, they're not, some of them aren't yet published, but this place, and it was called um, Finca Guadalajara. A Guadalajara is, is a place where bamboo grows. So if, it, if you have a little creek, oftentimes these bamboos will get established in the creek and they, they produce a big population. So that's called a guaduale because it, it's, a, it's a place where a bunch of uh, guaduas occur. And so this little finca guas, los guaduales was very nice. But then, then the, 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 uh, the FARC, the, the, you know, the tourist element, they drove uh, my friend away. Jim and his wife Meredith moved from Colombia down to Ecuador. And they did the same thing again. They just walked into another, another little remote place and started up another farm. Now it's been taken over by roads and development and <coughs> a dam. So poor Jim West has had uh, some bad luck with developing a nice conservation region. So you said you said the land is that you know <coughs> intact land is cheaper because people can't imagine what to do with it, and then it turns out in, intact land is cheaper than developed land. Like something that's oh yeah, because it costs, it costs them a lot of money to get the cut the trees off. <clears throat> right now it's true that they can sell some of that, but you remember. Where they're cutting the trees off often is a long, long way from the market. In other words, if you had a big tree, say 100 feet long with a, with a trunk, <coughs> three feet in diameter, what, what the hell would you do with it? You couldn't haul it anywhere. I mean, you, the only thing you could do is cut it up and burn it because 
you couldn't possibly move it anywhere. It would take a caterpillar just to pick it up. And, and there's no road. So the people that are cutting the forest off, they're a long way from the roads. So the forest is literally of no value to them at all. They, their, their first objective is take a chainsaw, cut down the trees, set on the fire, burn the whole damn thing down. And then with the ash that's left over, they can grow crops for about a year. Until they, until they burn out the soil and it's got... In other words, the ash right. is rich. Right. But, of course, when it rains, and it always does down there... Oh, that wash That away. ash will eventually wash away. Some of, the, some of the nutrients from the ash gets into the soil. So you would have soil with nutrients for a period of time. But, as I said, tropical soils do not hold nutrients very long. They burn up. They, they, they wash away because it's raining constantly and it's constantly hot. You take heat and water, and you dissolve everything, and it all flush, it all washes away like flushing sticks down a toilet. Do you think perspectives are changing now? People are starting to realize the the ecotourism potential for some of these these intact forests, or, or anything like that, or not really? No, no, it's it's obviously changed a lot, and, and there are there are a lot of people who are uh, who are conservation minded, but man, that's that's completely irrelevant to the people who are out there in the country. They they they, they don't even know this. I mean, they don't know anything about conservation and they don't care anything about conservation all they're trying to do is survive you know they're they got wife and four kids and and they need food so they need to get a pig and a cow and and uh, and the way they do that is to you know buy a pig and buy a pair of pigs or a pregnant pig and take it someplace and you're you you just you build up your life with what little bit you got uh, this is this is true all over the world you know people farmers eke out a living under very harsh circumstances, I know myself because we were we were farmers. We were poor. You make no money. I mean, you raise pigs, you raise cows, whatever you raise, you sell them at a loss. Uh, I mean, it's very it's very easy to lose money farming. In so fact, a lot of farmers say, "I'll just gotta keep on farming until I until I go broke." So it <laughs> seems like you know alleviating poverty and increasing education opportunities. Those are good ways to uh, you know have uh, have. You know, effects on conservation basically. They're good for conservation. Oh, absolutely. Bring absolutely. up the quality of life, increase opportunities for education, start to alleviate poverty so people aren't pushed into these desperate, desperate circumstances. And you can reverse the situation. I mean, it takes a long time and it's impossible if you burn it all off. But I mean, forests will recoup. If you if you leave it alone, the secondary force, leave the secondary force alone, those things, primary force is primary for a reason. It is primary because it's the climax. It's what it's what happens if you leave things alone. So if you take a if you take a secondary forest, leave it alone. Don't burn it. Over a hundred years, it will turn back into what it was originally. But if you take it away too far from the seed sources, then of course you're not going to have a regrowth of anything because you won't have any seeds. Right. You need some leftover forest. You need intact. leftover forest to, to repopulate. To reseed. I a, right. I have a friend in uh, in Colombia who has he. He was a he was he, he got wealthy in the United States, uh, running a business selling veterinarian products that he made that he developed and, and, and produced and invented. And when he retired, he liked to study butterflies and hummingbirds and this sort of thing. And when he found this rare hummingbird, he decided he would go look and see where it, where it came, comes from. So he went all the way into this remote place to see this hummingbird. And while he was there. The people said, "Well, you know, you can buy this land here," and because he probably was asking about, you know, what does it cost? And it's always oh, it's you can buy it cheaply, you know. So he invested in in he bought this stuff. He bought ended up buying three thousand hectares, and then they uh, then he began to develop uh, the area between the, the land. So he had virgin forest here. He had virgin forest over there, and so then he repopulated. Uh, he had trees planted in these intervening areas and there's a there's a concrete company in Colombia I've forgotten the name of the company but because they've got a lot of money and because they feel a little bit uh, maybe guilty about spreading concrete over the whole country they 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 they're willing to pay to have forest redeveloped in places so they'll pay for seeds, and they will pay for people to put them in. So they're restoring degraded areas. They are restoring. They, what they do is they, they get about 20 species of trees, and they plant them in areas where they where they would appropriately grow. And then they're pretty much on their own because you can't water them. Uh, you know, when you got 
trees scattered over the over 100 hills, half acre. You can't you can't go out there every day and water them. So they have to rely on the local humidity and so forth. But most of these things survive. And over time, these areas that are repopulated with trees, they become they look exactly like the virgin forest near them. Of course, they're not. They're not nearly as rich, but they nevertheless look very marvelous. When I look out to see the, from the virgin forest to the virgin forest, and I see the forest in between, it literally looks very similar. So uh, even though it's not a species rich, it's going to become just like the other. Given enough time, those pieces of forest will be recuperated and they will have the same species in them that the other one does. And this, it will just take a long time. And this space in between was formerly degraded and, and used for agriculture? No, nothing but a cow pasture, yeah. Wow, Christ. They first, they first uh, farm raising corn at certain elevations, a little bit higher up, they have raised other things. They raise citrus or they raise bananas or they, they raise avocados. This particular area where he lives, there's a lot of avocados. So any piece of forest that gets cut off, it turns it into avocado plantations because avocados are a good cash crop, especially these little round ones that, that, that comes out of Colombia. They're, they're very durable and they, they're easily transportable. Now some, mang some, uh, some avocados are, you know, you, they perish before they get to the market. But, you know, to see how foolish agricultural is, I was in an area one time where I was finding all these new species. And it was a place that was being farmed, you know, all around it. And I saw this lady coming out carrying uh, a big branch of uh, platanos. Now, platanos are kind of a banana. They're a big banana. Uh, and you know how big a cluster of bananas. It can be 100 pounds. So this lady was carrying out this big cluster of platano on her back, and she had cut herself. She was bleeding blood out of both arms. You know, she had actually injured herself in doing all this work. And she took that platano out to the road, and she would not have gotten a dollar for the damn thing. Probably, probably today, maybe three dollars. In other words, she's raising something that was not very valuable. And yet, she was trampling on plants that you could have sold for $500 each. I mean, Warakianum, Anthurium Warakianum, Anthurium vichii. I mean, beautiful plants that even a piece of the damn thing would sell for $50. You take a stem and cut it up and sell each piece for $50. So if they were able to market the local native flora, she would have made a lot more money. But that's illegal. It's not legal to sell la naturaleza. So it's completely illegal. It's not just it's, no, it's, it's, it's not it's, just regulated. No, it's, it's illegal. Completely it's illegal. It's you, illegal because it's, you cannot sell a native plant. That's kind of a now, shame because if they were selling it, then that would that would act as a way of conserving it too, propagating it. Because you could, she could have left the forest alone. She could have put a, a, a net under the forest, made out of moss, and she could have take, taken seeds from about fifty different species of plants, grown them on a net in the forest, in the semi shade uh, shade of the forest, and then sold those seeds for five dollars a piece, or maybe the plants, the little plants that would generate. But unfortunately, they have no way of doing this. These, these guys, first of all, they, they do they do take things from, into the market and they sell them, but only the really pretty things. But the, for, the fact is that almost any plant in that forest that she tried to sell could be sold at a lot with a lot of money, with the proper marketing. Because good many of them are new species. And if you say this is a new species of anthurium, you know, you, you, you quadruple the price of the thing. But CITES, I take it, is what prevents her from doing this. No, it's the government. The, it's government, the government does it. Why does the, why does the government not want people selling these things? Because it's la naturaleza. It's, it's, you, can't, you can't take animals and or plants out of our country and sell them. I mean, they could, they could legalize it and just make sure people aren't poaching it and are instead actually, you actually know, propagating some, it. Some countries have, and in fact, Equigenera is a company that sells orchids and aeroids. And they do it legally because they got a permit from the government. And they they are initially allowed to collect so many species and then propagate them indefinitely. So if you get uh, several plants and you're able to cross-pollinate them, you can produce seeds and then with the seeds you can generate plants to sell. Or, as Equigenera does, you can take you can take a, uh, take a tip of the apical meristem put it in, in gel and put it on a shaking table and, 
and you can produce thousands of plants. With tissue culture. With tissue right. culture. And of course, you set up a tissue culture lab, and down there it's not so expensive to put up a tissue culture lab. The labor is inexpensive, and uh, you know it's just a shaking table and a and a, and a bunch of a bunch of auger, and you know it's pretty easy. The sterile b business is, is much more difficult. You know, you got to keep everything, everything, absolutely everything. It's got to be very sterile. So on this note, that that leads me to another question: Have you seen? You've definitely seen an uptick in popularity of these plants of this whole plant family in the last few years, I assume, uh -huh. huh? Especially during COVID, I think what happened during COVID was everybody was stuck at home, bored as hell, and they still had email. They still had and, and things like Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram. Those those social media companies became very popular during during the COVID lockdown, and thousands of people all over the world started exchanging pictures. Some of them exchanged pictures of plants. And when they when they sent a picture of their plant that they bought at the market, uh, everybody was interested in well, what is that and where did it, where did it come from and and uh, could I get one? And so then they started swapping plants. And so many many of them started little businesses. They started propagating plants that they bought, and they would sell them. So these little businesses were uh, further popularizing uh, the, the group. I mean, I went to Germany at the uh, at the request of uh, Equigenera for a meeting. And it was just a sales meeting uh, where, the, where people from all over Northern Europe were going to, to this little town in Germany at this greenhouse where they were selling plants. And I was just astonished that people took whole carloads of stuff back and they were paying $100 <laughs> a piece for these plants. But so, especially though, it seems because aeroids, I mean, if you can maintain the humidity, which is the one thing a lot of people have trouble with in their apartments, these are this is a plant family that general, generally tolerates low light, would you say? That, well, it, it requires a little light. If you put them in too much light, they're, they're not going to do well. Right. So in, in most most apartments or houses, even if they seem bright to us because our pupils dilate, yeah, it's still pretty dark and for the a people, plant. And the people that are purchasing these plants are typically young professional people who have plenty of money. They're working in the high-tech businesses, and they have plenty of money, although some of them are just... Happy to throw six I grand I remember a, one of these ladies was a barista, uh, you know, uh, making coffee or uh, something like that. And... Uh, but she had enough money to uh, to go to all, drive all the way to Germany and, and buy plants. So it was uh, it was astonishing because it was my first real experience after COVID, and to see how many people were selling and buying plants. I mean, the the, the membership of the International Aeroid Society has like quadrupled. And this isn't something you saw ten years ago. I mean, no, a, a no, exponential no. growth. Furthermore, I used to sell plants a little when we had we had seedlings. We'd grow them. I'd sell a nice little plant for like two dollars or a dollar and a half. <laughs> and I mean, those those plants, those plants today would sell for twenty five dollars. I see people selling plants, philodendrons, for six thousand, ten thousand dollars. It's nuts. It's yeah, uh, when you get when there's a mystique about a plant and it's it's rare and, and people want that they want that plant like Anthurium Santa Leopoldina or Anthurium. It's now called uh, Spiritus Sancti. Anthurium Spiritus Sancti. It's a rare species from the coast of. Uh, Brazil, and I don't particularly think it's such an exciting plant, but it's got this mystique that it's rare and de rare, rare and, and, and important and costly. And so we would sell, we would have one of these plants, and every year we'd manage to get one cutting out of that thing to grow, and we'd sell it for sixteen hundred dollars, six hundred dollars, two thousand dollars. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. And one night I had a, I had a philodendron that I had named after my wife, philodendron patrici. And I don't know who it's growing. I think, I, got, I think it came from Enid Alvater. But anyway, somebody had it at the auction at the IAS. And I said, Look, now this, this is the plant that I named after my wife. And I said, I don't want you to let it go cheap. So, so they started the bid. And that thing sold for $750. Oh, my God. For a, nothing but a plant with two leaves on it. I bet that made her feel good, huh? Did you oh, talk? She she, didn't she, care. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she's not. A, she's not. Okay. No. She's not a fan. Well, you know, if this ends up, I mean, if, if aeroids end up getting people into, you know, appreciating nature or just even, you know, taking a closer look at evolution or wondering about variations on a form and how they evolve and how natural it's it seems like it's a pretty good, it's a pretty good thing. I like maybe, maybe aeroids are someone's gateway drug into botany itself or just appreciating nature. I mean, that seemed what the benefit of COVID was is you're trapped inside your house. So just start making your house as nice yeah. as possible. Well, one thing that's neat about uh, aeroids, and it's, it, there are very few, very few families of plants that have this capability. 
they have what is known as a caudex. A caudex is a type of stem that every node of the stem, every node of the stem, has the potential for a leaf, a root, and an inflorescence. So, all you need is one node. If you can keep it alive, you cut it, put some wax on the end of it, and keep it from drying out, that thing will turn into a plant. And not very many plants, not many plant, uh, plant families can do this. I mean, even orchids, you've got to, you've got to get a, a, a pretty healthy pseudobulb, or, and, you, and you, you can't start them from seed. So it's, the aeroids are just remarkable. You can pick it up and carry it someplace. And most families, you can't. You can't take a Loraceae, you know, you can carry the seed, but then you gotta wait 100 years to get a to get a flower, so it's it, you know there's just and the other thing that's nice nice about aeroids is that <coughs> even though the plant may never flower or even though people don't even know it flowers because the flowers may be inconspicuous, you look at the leaf alone, just the leaf is it's a pretty thing, it's got some characteristic about it that's pretty, so so the the, the aeroids really have something kind of unique, most of them are attractive by themselves, just the leaves alone. So they don't mind that it doesn't have a flower. In fact, many people, they say, well, this plant, this plant doesn't ever produce flowers. I say, sure, because you just, you, you just got a juvenile plant. Put it on a tree, I says, it'll, it'll, it'll grow up 20 feet in the air and it'll be, a, it'll be an adult plant and it will produce all kinds of inflorescences. They don't realize it. You put a plant in a pot, Monstera or Syngonium, Raphidophora, almost all those things. They will grow for hundreds of years if you don't give it a tree to climb on. They just grow around and around and around. So if they and can't get up into the canopy and get if more they light. Can't, if they, it, it, it's probably a water stress in the stem or something. There's got to be some reason why at certain point on the tree, it says, hey, this is where I want to be, the right water tension, the right light, the right humidity, and I'm going to become an adult. And at that point, they start those inner nodes, which may be six centimeters long, they become shorter and shorter and wider and wider. Every internode has exactly the same volume. Well, if it's long, it's skinny. If it's broad, it's, it's short. So once they get to a certain optimum point, they turn quickly into an adult plant, produce adult leaves and flower. Now what's the, what's the main obstacle somebody in say like a Manhattan apartment might experience if they're growing one of these things and it's just not doing well for them? Would you say it's humidity? Because humidity in the winter time in some of these northern latitudes can be a real pain in the ass, right? I mean, what's the... Yeah, but they'd know immediately if it was low humidity because the plant would start drying up. Mm -hmm. It would even start yellowing. So, but, but uh, aeroids are remarkable. I mean, they do not necessarily need high humidity. You can, you can actually grow many aeroids in, in ordinary house conditions. And that's why they're, again, so successful. Because when people buy an aeroid and they have it in their house... Almost always, it does survive. Uh, you buy a jesnerad, or an orchid, or a lily, or something like that. Sometimes after a year or two, it might be a flowers once, and then it never comes back again. But an arrow, just it hangs right on there and keeps on growing. Uh, I because they're they're pre-adapted to dry conditions. I mean, some of them aren't, of course, but uh, many of them are pre-adapted through the epiphytic habit. Epiphytic habits are dry because when it's not raining, they have only atmospheric humidity. And well, if, they have no no way, if they have no way to getting that water out of the atmosphere, and of course some do, but most of them don't. Right. They, they simply have to wait to, for it to rain. And they're growing on the side of the tree. The side of the tree becomes very desiccated because it's not wet any longer. Right, and there's no soil to hold and any moisture. And nothing's dripping down the tree. When it's raining, there's nutrients coming down the tree. Mosses, lichens, uh, manure from animals slipping down the tree and it's, it's, pollen, it's, it's, it's providing that plant with, with nutrients. That, uh, those pachyneriums that we looked at last week which have these bird nest things, those things are ideally designed for very low humidity areas because they may occur, they may get only humidity when, when it's cloudy. So the clouds come in from the ocean in the afternoon and at a certain point the, the water condenses and it hangs right at that space. Might be 1500 meters to 1550 meters. There's this little band of watery, water-filled air. And in those little bands of water-filled air, you have epiphytes thriving. And it never rains there. And they only get the humidity from the afternoon cloud forest. And 
So if you ask the people locally, well, oh, it only rains one week, week out of the year, and that's during the particular period of time. And the rest of the time, it doesn't rain. But nevertheless, you've got epiphytes, orchids, aeroids, other things that are epiphytes growing in this in this afternoon cloud. Just forest. getting all their moisture from, from, from the fog, air. from water vapor. And and usually that's plenty because they they are easily they they capable they capture their uh, their their energy very well. They're not as good as bromeliads. I mean, bromeliads, they're just remarkable. They can actually take air, take water out of the air and then not let go of it. I mean they they do everything in an enclosed environment. But aeroids, uh, you know, do have stomata, and they do they do lose most, most some water. You want to? They have they have rather thin leaves too sometimes. You want to check out some more species there? Sure, sure. These spotted leaves, and this which is, is this why is they're Diefen, so popular. This is Diefenbachia. Diefenbachia. They're terrestrial plants. They grow well in the ground. Uh, you could plant them in your garden. Uh, they will, of course, be in. You have to be in a frost-free area. But I plant them outdoors in the summertime. Just dig them up and throw them back in the pot when I when I bring them in. But they, they're like philodendron. They will open up in the, in the late afternoon. They're pollinated at night. And I'm going to open this up to show you. Let me pull it out here. To show you how, it's, how it differs from philodendron. I broke off part of the peduncle. The peduncle is a little bit longer. And they're, they don't like to open up once they've closed. None of these things do. But notice that the flowers, the female flowers, they're the little yellow things. And all around the little yellow things, there's a kind of a cream-colored thing that was once very white. Those are those are Staminodia. That is what the beetles eat when they pollinate this plant. They eat those little ball bats. Those little, they look like. Are they little, having orgies in here too? Or yes, what? exactly the same thing. Same thing. There's sex. Sex is involved. In so all just the sex in a buffet. Sex and a buffet is involved with almost all pollination of all organisms. It's all Jeez. about. It's all about oh sex. Oh my God. <laughs> And notice that this male flowers, they become quite pretty. It's kind oh, of yeah, orange. Wow, look at that. But when it was originally open, it was just white. So are then, the, these these are mature at the bottom, and the ones up top aren't well, mature? Well, no, these are, no, no, this is this is post-anthus. That's already had its oh, pollen come okay. out. This is already shot. It didn't get pollinated, of course, because we got no beetles in here. But notice that these are sterile staminodia, too. But those things and these probably are both eaten by the insect. And this, of course, would not be because it pollen is not, it would be like eating sand. Mm -hmm. pollen, pollen has silica in it and, and it would be very difficult to digest or chew. But the Diefenbachia uh, is a group of perhaps about 150 species, although it could have, it could have 300 for are all. Are they all terrestrial? They're all terrestrial. Although some of, some of them will, we had one growing on a on the wall back there, and the thing I got about 20 feet high. Just grew up <laughs> because it, we were tying it to the wall, so I just normally Diefenbachia, they'll only get as tall as depending on the girth of the stem. If it's a skinny stem, about a one centimeter in diameter, it won't get very tall because the stem doesn't have any strength. Uh, if it's bigger, then it can get taller because the stem can remain erect longer. What happens is that the stem just gets, keeps getting pushed down to the ground as the weight of the plant progresses. So it, it, it ends up all on the ground. I've seen Diefenbachias with, with stems that go off to the horizon, just you know, 20 feet away, the, the stem is still above the ground and still alive. And you'll see it, 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 it just has a few seeds here. The, the, the flowers of this thing, there's only a few female flowers. What is this? Eglonema. And Eglonemas are terrestrial plants. They, they're very much like Diefenbachias. And they often have these variegated pants. Sometimes they're astonishingly beautiful. Eglodema has, I don't know, perhaps 150 species, but they're very colorful. Most of them are very beautiful plants. And they're Asian, so I don't have a whole lot of them. But uh, if you were in Asia, you would find you'd see them all over the place. Philippines. Oh my God! Where 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 did you collect this? Where's this anthurium from? Okay, from Jesus Christ, that's insane. Well, it produces leaves almost three meters long. Oh my God. And they hang, they hang down from trees with just a few roots, so, they, so they're able to just kind of, they're able to just kind of wiggle in the wind. What's, would you, do you know the species of this one? Can you I, recall? I described it, but I can't remember the name. You, uh, and there's another one on there. Keep your eyes on these things. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, we got quite a few of them in here that have the wrong names on them or never. So who's this? What's this? 
this is Spermifilum lensifolium from, from Venezuela. And you'll see that this has hermaphroditic flowers. That is to say, it's like anthurium and like stainless formation. These are all the same throughout. And these long things that are sticking out there, that's the pistil. Mm. That's the thing that produces the seed. And these usually have two or three little, little locules, two or three little compartments. And each one will have up to one to five seeds. Um, so I, this is these are the female flowers, and then what are the male flowers? No, no, like? these are bisexual flowers. They're hermaphroditic or bisexual. But flowers. I mean, the the rods are, are female. No, they're that's the female portion. Yeah. Right, and then so what is the what's the male portion? Well, the male portion, like? the stamens are down, the stamens are clear down inside. They've they've already they haven't come out yet. They will emerge just sticking out here up against. And the they'll system. and and each flower stamens will be surrounding that little rod. Yes, it'll have uh, it'll have four stamens. And they'll be sticking up alongside the, the style. <clears throat> these these little the styles are very important in uh, philodendron because they they may be very short or they may be long or they may be uh, we use the, the the styles are important taxonomically. But this is spat the film. Yes, and I'm currently getting ready to publish a paper with close to 50 new species of spat the film, and most of them are not closely related to this. But rather, there there's little tiny ones that that grow in streams, remote streams. Uh, I think that the reason why there are so many species is that the, the streams are separated. The bees, are, these things are bee pollinated, probably by euglossine bees. And so these populations uh, growing in this little stream and the stream way over there, they're completely separated geographically. And they're just evolving like they're evolving every place you go there's another species stuck in a little stream it so, can't get out of the stream because it's, it's restricted to that stream so these are pollinated by euglossian bees where's the scent where's the cologne that they're producing uh i don't know where it's produced but it's from the inflorescence i mean it's from the spadix mm. and so what's the habit of this this is terrestrial it's a climber they, aquatic they generally have a little short stem and they're generally growing on rocks or in sand uh or directly in the water you know, rooted in the bottom of the, the stream, but they're, they're nearly always associated with water. The reason is that they require, they have thin leaves and they require a lot of water. Anybody who has a spathophyllum cultivated in their house realizes you have to water it about twice to three times as much as you would any other plant. They are real water hogs. They require a lot of water. Right in their nose, they produce long petioles and they produce a fairly boring leaf. It's just, it's just kind of an oblong elliptic, nearly ovate, oblong elliptic blade. But always growing around rivers or riparian systems. Well, not all of them, because some of, some of these will grow right in a forest. Some of these big ones like this, they will grow in a forest, but they, they do like water, and even if they're in a forest, they're going to be somewhere near near a stream, because they probably root into the stream. But, uh, you can see them. They're, they're kind of boring in, in, the sense, in, the, in the sense that they don't have a lot of variability. They're almost always, they always have leaves of similar shape. And in fact, not only are they boring in terms of the leaf shape, if you look at this leaf when it's dried, both surfaces are practically the same. Mm -hmm. I mean, they do not have a lot of good characters in the leaf. So how do you separate them? Well, you separate them by their inflorescence. In this case, the inflorescences are quite quite uh, unique, and also the degree to which they're sheathed. You'll see this one is sheathed all the way up to the tip. That sheath goes clear to the bottom all the way to the leaf. And others, the sheath just goes to here. See, that's got a great big terete part. So, so I was going to say, what, what if they're not flowering? What do you do? You just got to wait or you collect the piece? Well, no, you can tell them apart. Uh, you can tell them apart. You can see how they're different. but Generally, yeah. But it, 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 the, the key characters are not really super good. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I think it's going to have about 160 species, maybe. It's not a big genus, but even so, uh, the paper I'm getting ready to publish has around 50 species, so I, that's almost 50% increase in the size of the, of the genus. And uh, I suspect that if I went to other herbaria, I'd find a lot more new ones, too. I'm just looking at the ones that I have here. We have a new species that I found in the, in the greenhouse that I had collected uh, back in Mexico many years ago. And it's flowered many times, but I suddenly realized it wasn't what I was calling it. It was a new species. 
species. And you'll see that uh, they can get very soil for the pot, they, they will pop. Okay, so what's what's going on here? Okay, this this is stemless formation, and you'll notice that the leaves are long and narrow. And another thing you'll notice is look at how boring it is. That thing it doesn't have any primary lateral veins. So stemless formation is a plant that has elongated leaves, and there are, there are practically you can't see the primary lateral veins. There actually is one, but it's it's so inconspicuous. So inconspicuous primary lateral veins. Now it's very closely related to another genus called Rhodospatha, which have kind of banana-like leaves with very prominent veins. But uh, they, they both produce the same kind of inflorescence. And then they have long sheathed petioles too. So long sheathed petioles, uh, leaves that are have very little relief and texture. And I want to find an inflorescence so that you can see what the plant. There's the spathe. Normally the spathe falls off right away. But on this species, the spathe kind of hangs around probably because it's not raining enough in here. But uh, this thing actually sits through it and these berries actually will produce viable seeds. It's obviously being pollinated by itself. Oh, so no, these are self-fertile. So this is a stenospermation flower. Yes, it is. Or inflorescence, rather. Yeah, this is a, and you can see that's about the size of the original spadix, but it's, it's developing berries. And here's this, here it's almost, and we have planted these and they will produce berries. I mean, yeah. seeds. They yeah, produce fruits. Uh, plants. Now here's one that's just, uh, it hasn't opened yet, but that, that'll that get the size of that thing and then it'll open up. And it opens up like this. And in this case, it stays, it stays sort of open. It doesn't fall off. Generally speaking, stennous formation spades will fall off the very night that they open. You don't even see them. They, they loosen up. And as they loosen up, they, they look a little bit like this. So the beetles crawl in just where the thing is sort of getting a bit loose, it will crawl inside and pollinate the plant even before the spathe is anywhere near open. By the time the beetle, uh, the, by the time the spathe opens up, it's all over. The pollination has been done and the beetle flies away. It does not stay there. It's not like the, it's not like the beetles that were pollinating Giffenbachia and Xanthosoma and Philodendron where the beetles stay there and have sex. These beetles, I think, are eating, maybe. So this gets it done quick, why is that? What do you think? I don't know, but it's obviously pollinated by a different organism, but we don't know what they're pollinating. We don't know what the organisms are. I have seen little rootaline scared beetles in these things, but I'm kind of suspicious that they may not be what's actually pollinated. And where are these distributed? Uh, Stenos formation is neotropical and it ranges largely in the northern Andes. It ranges from Guatemala all the way to Bolivia. But they're largely in the Andes. They're, they're, largely, they're largely species that occur in cloud forests. And you don't find cloud forests much in the Amazon basin. There are a couple of species that occur in the Amazon basin, but most of the species actually occur in the Andes because they live in cloud forests. Okay, so what's going on with this? You got Anthurium right here. Yeah, this is Anthurium thompsonii. It was named after a colleague of mine who uh, was working with a, a Cuban lady, a Cuban botanist who worked on air rides. And because Sue helped her, this lady named a species after her. And I went to Cuba uh, a couple of years ago, and I found a little tiny plant like this, about this big. And I brought it back, forgot about it completely. I, I, I put it in the greenhouse. And, and then I noticed, geez, I, I came in here one day and I said, God, this is the of time. Sonia, I don't know, what is this? Well, that's my collection from Cuba. And I thought, good God, this doesn't look like the plant at all. So I thought, surely this is not the, my plant. There must be some mistake. But in fact, I looked to check the number and it was it was Anthurium thompsonia, which the type of this plant that was that was published was a little plant, a little plant. It had leaves like this, but a tiny little plant. So I assumed Thompsonia was just a little morphy, a little tiny thing. But this 
this plant, when put under proper conditions to grow, got very large. So in fact, I, I, I re-vouchered the plant to create another specimen to prove that Anthrium thompsonii could become a big plant. So it wouldn't be misrepresented as a smaller statured plant than the herbarium, basically. Because when it was originally right. described, it was described from a very small plant. And what? Because, because I had this big plant, I, I felt it was imperative that I, that I uh, produce a, a voucher showing the, you know, that the plant gets quite large. And what's the habitat like in Cuba? Just lowland tropical forest? Uh, well, much of Cuba is dry, but this, this uh, plant came from a, a place in the southeast near Guantanamo Bay. And it, it's a famous area that's uh, in the mountains above a place called Santiago. Santiago de Cuba is a is a city on the south coast of uh, of Havana, uh, it's a long way from Havana, but it's it's down near near Guantanamo Bay. So these this got pollinated then somehow I guess there's good fruit that's good fruit it looks like. Well yeah, I mean it's possible that it's possible that we actually tried to pollinate it, but I don't remember doing it. But it it's only got a couple of seeds, so that's probably not even. I, I suspect those seeds are probably not viable. Oh, well, they might be duds. No, uh, they're probably. Just God, it feels, it's so fleshy. So it's uh, you know this is obviously very conspicuous that a bird's going to come here. If this was if this was in situ, and it and pick up the seed, disperse yeah. it, you know, poop poop the seed sure. out somewhere. And, and well, here's the here's the nice thing about anthurium seeds. They're designed for short dispersal. And here's the why: if you grab that seed, pop it in your mouth, you get a little sweetness, and then that's immediately followed by bitterness that is so bad <laughs> that you spit it out. So the bird, if he's going to get that seed, he gets a moment of sweetness, and then he wants to get it rid of it. So they're fooling the dispersers, basically. They don't want the damn bird to eat the right, thing because it'll right. kill the seed. That's, that's so they want, pretty... to, they want to pick it up and, and, and get the sweetness, but then get rid of it. By that time, the bird is, you know, someplace else. They get that bitterness and spit it out. And, and, it's, then... and, and, and here's the, here's, here's <laughs> the other pretty, thing. It's a really neat It's pretty thing. slick. The really neat thing about anthurium is when you squeeze the berry of an anthurium, it pops out two seeds, and those seeds are so sticky that if you have, if you get them on your fingers, you think, well, no, no, it, it just, it, it just sticks to water. You can't take it off your hand. So the only way to get rid of it is to suck it, kick it in your mouth, and spit it out because the water keeps from getting sticky. <laughs> so imagine this seed that the bird has captured, and he, he squeezed the seed, and he's gotten the berries out, the seeds out of the berry. And he wants to get rid of this thing now. He spits this. He spits the thing out, but the seed is stuck to his beak. And how do you get the seed off your beak? You got no fingers, so they go to a tree and they go. They wipe it on the tree, <laughs> and that seed is stuck to the tree then. And it's, in, in other words, the seed has a stickiness. It's got a little gelatinous attachment on both ends, and it's ideally designed to be stuck to a tree and then if you stick it in the right place where there is a chance that it will germinate and have some nutrients like in a crack or on a niche in the bark or something then you've got an up you got a situation where the seed can grow it's in a highly humid place the seed germinates and anthurium seeds can germinate very quickly in fact oftentimes they're falling off of the infarctuses because there's no birds carrying them away and they're falling on a leaf and the leaf is completely covered with plants because they're germinating on the leaf, and the, the plants have it have two or three leaves already, okay. little little seedlings with with uh, several leaves. Getting getting your dispersers to, to not only not eat you and spit you out because you're bitter, but also you know because you've got this gelatinous texture, so they want to you stick you stick to them and they end up just wiping you off. That's pretty ingenious. Yeah, the seed the seed itself is not sticky, but there's a little attachment. The, mu little, the no, mucilage. Little, there's a little thing stuck to both ends of the seed, either one end or both ends, and that that little bit of mucilage is super sticky. I mean, because I, I harvest these seeds all the time, try to, you know, I try to squeeze them out of the seeds and bring back the seeds, but the only way you can either do this is in water. You you, you put them in water, you, you mash them with a, in a sieve, you mash them up, you mash the berries out, and you get the seeds, and then you put the seeds in a, in a jar, and you shake the jar up, and that, then the uh, the pericarp will become disattached from the seed, and the seeds will float. No, sorry, the seeds will sink to the bottom, 
and the pericarp floats. So that's a way of separating the junk from the seed, and then you, you, you decant off the, the junk, the, the pericarp, and you, you're left with the seeds. So it's, it's kind of easy to, to harvest the seeds from an anthurium. Every one of these little points that you see here will produce a berry. We've only got two or three berries on there because it was really never pollinated. So that whole infertestus will have. It'll be completely of a covered with thousands of seeds. Yeah. So you were saying so so two seeds per berry. So every every yeah, so flower has two locules. Every two, every flower has the potential of producing two seeds. Two carpels. And that's true of most anthuriums. All those anthuriums, section porphyrochitonum, a group that's super super rich. It may have four seeds or six seeds, but they're smaller seeds. This is anthurium section. Which one? Porphyrochitonium. Okay. And porphyrochitoniums, they're probably they're probably a thousand species alone in just that section. This is clearly the largest section of all anthuriums, and the most likely to have new species. Nearly all of them are new. In fact, when Engler treated anthurium, there was one porphyrochitonium, and now, as I'm suggesting, there's probably five, there's probably a thousand species in anthurium section porphyric actonium alone. And they have kind of boring flowers. Uh, the, the spades and faces are not particularly interesting. But every plant, there's, there's so much variability in the whole thing. And when you go into a jungle, oftentimes you'll see the forest floor is just covered with anthurium porphyric actonium. And a lot of people think they're all the same. Yes, it's all one, one species. But if you collect them and grow them, you'll realize they're not the same at all. They, they have different scents, they flower at different times, they have different colors, different colored berries, different shaped berries. So there's lots of variability in these. And it's the group that is probably the least obvious, the least conspicuous. What are some synapomorphies of this section? Uh, there, there are several. It, it's probably the, the most natural section, in my opinion. It has, first of all, they have long legs, quite a few veins, and they have glandular punctations on the lower surface, little black glands. They're not just dots. They're really, they look like glands. They're little things that are shaped like a plate. They may be recessed or they may be raised, but they are, and I see them, I, I see them producing little, little drops of water. So I think they're probably originally a gland. And what its purpose is, I don't know. But perhaps, perhaps it's lubrication, just to allow the leaf to get out without being wrecked by the caterpillar. Perhaps it's an ancient means to attract ants. Because, as you know, ants are very important in the life of plants. Many ants are protecting the plant. The new leaves of the plant uh, are producing nectar for the leaf, for the for the ants. Certain ants collect this nectar <coughs> and they won't let any other ant on there because they're collecting the nectar. And because they won't let any other ant on, that means they keep away the, the leaf cutter ants and the ants that would chew, chew that plant to pieces. So they protect the plant while it's young, while its leaf is just like a piece of toilet paper. That's an important stage of life because once the plant is kind of hard, then they're not so easily eaten by Insects. Do many aeroids produce extra floral nectaries? Yes. Uh, Philodendron very often has in, uh, uh, extra floral nectaries. The, the petioles are often glandular, producing a, producing a, 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 a solution. And also, uh, there are species that produce little uh, little things in the in the axils of the leaves. I think they're domatia, maybe not not nectaries, but but insects are attracted to these little pockets and they live in there. Mm. So they really tiny, tiny insects may be occurring in the, in the axles of the leaf uh, below. Because it's a nice house. They are protected from the rain and uh, you know, for um, tiny little insects that are microscopic. You know. Oh, so not just ants, not just myrmecophytes. No, I don't other... think they're, I, they may not even be ants, but they, they're, they're little insects that live in these little pockets. Any, like, a lot of times these little pockets will, like the metal stomatacea, they produce little glands in there and they produce little trichomes. So they're, they're not only producing a place to eat, but the trichomes are providing them with a, a protective surface, you know, to prevent anything from seeing them or getting to them. 
historically there haven't been many people studying the aeroid family, Araceae, or, or what? You... Well, there were quite a few people that did study Araceae, but uh, keep in mind that most of the aeroids are in, in a place where where there weren't people, you know, or there weren't uh, botanists at least. And South America and Central America didn't develop its own local botanists for a long, long time. Most of the plants were, were discovered by Europeans who were traveling to the New World. And they took the things back to England and Belgium and France and where they were described as new. So initially when Linnaeus and other people were working on plants, they had no idea how many species there were. Obviously they, they, they were vastly under, undercounted. I mean, initially, all the aeroids in the world were in four genera. You know, Pothos, Dracontium, and a couple of others. But uh, it, then over time, you know, people said, well, this is not all the same thing. And then they started, and it was mostly H.W. Schott, a gardener in uh, Vienna, who described most of the species, most of the genera of Aeraceae. Because he was growing them in the greenhouse, and he could see that they didn't act anywhere near like it. So he just described one genus after another. But uh, as we as we develop into the new world, remember that most of the new, most of the first species were described from the Caribbean. Why? Because the Caribbean was where people first arrived. That's where Columbus arrived. That's where the British arrived. The British had their colonies there. The, there's various Jamaica, and Trinidad, Tobago, and various other places. So the, the people from Europe were mostly visiting the Caribbean initially, and to some extent Mexico. Much of South America was pretty much unexplored. I mean, when Pizarro came there, there were only Incas there, you know, there, there weren't any Europeans at all. So the, the, the initial plants that were collected were, the other thing is that aeroids are very hard to dry. You take a plant like this, with this petiole, it may take you hours and hours to dry. And, and in fact, if you look at the original collections by all the original people like Cecil Mocino, Triana and, and, and Blanchon, people like that, they were collecting plants, aeroids, but most of them didn't survive because they rotted. They had no way of really, they had no way of drying these things. Even in a good electric dryer, it takes three days. So here they were trying to dry it with charcoal and, you know, changing paper and they didn't, paper was hard to get. You know, you can imagine how, how, how you would be discouraged if you collected a bunch of aeroids and then they all died and rot, right? they all rotted. That's why the horticultural element was so important. These things, they, once people found that they were beautiful, then explorers went out looking just for the live plants. And they went out, brought them back, and put them in the ship with moss and with a way of keeping them alive until they could get, back, get them back to Europe where they grew them and then sold them. So from the very beginning, most of these plants were actually described by horticulturists who were growing them in Europe. They were hauled, hauled back from the neotropics and described in, in places in France, Belgium, and, and England. And it was only basically many years later that we came to really just start collecting them in, in earnest. In fact, I was one of the first people who collected large volumes of aeroids. And I didn't, I didn't start until 1967. So that's it's very recent. And uh, up until that time, not very many were collected because they're extremely difficult to dry. You basically had to take with you the facilities to dry them because the people where you went, there weren't any dryers. I built many dryers for electric, with, heated with electric or with gas. And I would take them down there, I would build these dryers, and I would I would leave them there so that the people would have something to collect plants and dry plants with. And then they came to dry and make their own dryers, but uh, uh, it's it's all a process of evolution of techniques for drying and how to collect them and how to preserve them and how to describe them. Most of the early botanists never did a very good job of describing them. So you have I have no, I have no idea what they were talking about unless you could see the actual specimen. So that's the adaptive benefit of that. Exactly. Young leaves are often this color because they, they really need, usually when the plant is young, it has those kind of leaves because it needs energy. And they get light that you don't get from a green leaf. This These red waves of light 
are able to penetrate deeper and therefore the plant gets energy from the sun because it's got those purple leaves. So it's, it's like and red and Red and purple are in the same sort of range. I don't know whether that's long wave, short wave. Uh, I, I don't know. I can't remember from from physics whether... I guess it would be longer wave, like Roy G. Biv, whereas the blue is the shorter length. And besides being you know, almost almost uh, reddish brown like that, that's the, the collective it has, light, basically. It almost certainly has to do with uh, the age of the plant. It's just the young leaves that have it. It hasn't become masked with chlorophyll yet. Oh yeah. But that that lover that purple is usually just on the youngest leaves. 